This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much, Tom, for setting the scene so beautifully, talking about translatability. And of course, you were talking more about translatability in the sense of understanding a situation um, and translatability of humour. And we are now coming uh, back to a more, more literal sense of translation, talking about language. Um, and I will just very briefly introduce the panel and, uh, and then let them speak for themselves. Um, so, very, very pleased to have you both here. Niels Bruns is um, uh, a Danish uh, translator and writer, and we've heard yesterday uh, a little bit about his work um, as translator of the uh, sonnets. Um, but overall, he has translated so far over 200, trans, uh, uh, 200 texts from English, German, and Russian into Danish. He has received very prestigious awards, including a lifelong grant from the Danish Arts Foundation, and I'm very excited to see a knighthood. Um, so, uh, he's working on a complete new Danish translation of Shakespeare's plays and sonnets, and has made quite considerable in ways, inroads into that. Um, and I hope to hear uh, uh, about that and to, 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 to find out about the translator's work. Lily Khan um, uh, will not speak about the process of translating, but uh, uh, about <coughs> the, the first Hebrew translation of a Shakespearean comedy. Lily is a lecturer in the Department of Hebrew and Jewish Studies at UCL, and she's specializing in um, uh, her special interest is in Hebrew in Eastern Europe. But uh, she's also editing a bilingual edition of the first two Shakespeare plays that were translated into Hebrew, and they were both translated in 1874, 1878, and they were Othello and Romeo and Juliet. But we're hearing about a, a comedy. So. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the introduction. I think I owe you to say that the night is not an English one, it's a Danish one. <laughs> 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 Um, I have given my paper the title Translating Shakespeare of the Bottom Line. And this bottom line is, uh, of course, the end result, the summing up of the pros and cons of translating Shakespeare, and specifically Shakespearean comedy. But it is also my starting point in another sense, namely as the famous line spoken by Quince in the third act of A Midsummer Night's Dream, bless thee, bottom, bless thee, thou art translating. This line is often used uh, as a joke and often at the cost of translators in as much as it's anything but flattering for their profession. Because what Quince and his fellow mechanicals see after the translation of Martin is not their dear familiar friend, but a hideous, disfigured monster showing unmistakable signs of asininity. So no wonder they flee in horror. I mean, translations don't have to be that bad. Uh, it is possible to translate even Shakespeare successfully, and uh, I have been doing so into Danish for almost 30 years now, and they haven't hanged me yet. So, what's the secret? First of all, one has to bear in mind that a translation is not and never can be an exact replica of an original. A translation is a representation of an original, you might even say a kind of portrayal of an original. What we usually hope for in a portrait is truth. It must be true to life, and a Shakespeare translation must be true to the life that is inherent in the text, the life which is best realized on the stage. And uh, I think uh, Tom Bishop just gave us uh, some very important reasons for why this is the case, that uh, it actually works better on stage. If we talk of Shakespeare's comedies, a comedy is supposed to be funny, at least part of the time, and there is no better way of killing a joke than having to explain it in a footnote. <laughs> so obviously the translator must find ways of making the text function in the target language, more or less as it functions in the source language, 
and that is something which certainly does not depend on the meaning alone. I'll try to explain this uh, through a few examples. Time doesn't allow very many, but uh, I'll concentrate on certain technicalities which present stumbling blocks for any translator of Shakespearean comedy or indeed Shakespeare's plays in general. Part of the message is, in fact, hidden in the form. The iambic pentameter is a very important vehicle for acting Shakespeare, and I always translate verse as verse, prose as prose, because the form definitely adds something to the characters. It's not mere convention or outdated fashion. If we go back to a Midsummer Night's Dream, most of it is in pentameter, and a lot of those lines are in fact rhyming couplets. I won't go into detail about the well-known problem of the many monosyllabic English words, which means that you need more syllables in Danish, for instance, to convey the same semantic content. And the meter puts no more than 11 syllables per line at most at your disposition. Neither will I lament the even more well-known problem that rhyming lines seldom rhyme when directly translated. The very first rhyme in the dream occurs when Hermia professes her love for Lysander. By the simplicity of Venus' stumps, by that which knitteth souls and prospers loves, and the Danish words for doves is duo, and for love, kærlighed, which <laughs> So I had to change these words uh, into with kærlighed skulle ingenes blive due, ved det der sætter sjæl og sin i due, which in literal back translation means by the gentle dove of the goddess of love, by that which sets soul and mind on fire. Because dure means flame and rhymes with dure, dove, and lo and behold, it even produced an unintentional rhyme with Cupid's bow, or boo, two lines above. Uh, so that's a kind of sneaky introduction of the emotional rhyming style. But why do I sacrifice the more, more exact equivalence of that which knitteth souls and pros prospers loves for the sake of rhyme? Because the meaning is easy to grasp anyway, and the shift to rhyme marks an increased intensity between the two young mothers. That, in fact, is a more important message than all the specific editing and prospering. A Midsummer Night's Dream was my very first translation of Shakespeare play. And uh, with the beginner's carefree restlessness, I did something to it that I have never done again. The dream is rich in <coughs> critical devices. The fairies speak sometimes in contaminant, sometimes in doggerel-like lines of four beats. And the hard-handed men of Athens play parts of their most lamentable comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe in a very artful stanza form with internal rhyme. And this apparent freedom of variation led me to give to Puck and to the pentameter parts of the Pyramus and Thisbe play a six-foot iambic meter with a caesura in the middle. How clever of me, I thought, because it would give me more space to solve the problem with the one syllables. Well, you will probably have recognized this meter now, uh, the Alexandra and the classical meter of French tragedy. Now, what on earth is that doing in the middle of a Shakespearean comedy? I didn't choose it at random, though. This meter has some very special connotations for Danish readers and theatre goers. And the story behind that is as follows. The Danish Norwegian poet and playwright Johan Hermann Wessel wrote in 1772 a generic parody of the French tragedy, which was then very fashionable in Denmark. His play, with the title Love Without Stockings, <laughs> but the content is just as silly as the title. Uh, it became a huge success, uh, so much that lots of people in his own time and well into the 19th century learned it virtually by heart and loved to quote from it. So I'm clearly born being one of those people. <laughs> Since it was extremely witty and surpassed the translated French tragedies and the Danish imitations of them in terms of literary quality. For a Danish audience, it became impossible to hear this distinctive meter spoken on stage without chuckling. French tragedy was forever deflated in Denmark, and uh, the effect lingered on even into my lifetime. I did read Love Without Stockings at grammar school, although I'm not quite sure the generations after me are familiar with it, sadly enough. 
So the effect of the Alexandrine in Danish theatres is comic rather than tragic, which is what I aimed at. My translation of the dream has been staged several times, and each time I've noted that my metrical, met, 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 metrical trick works well, even though the connection to a vessel may remain subconscious in most of the audience's minds or blankly non existent. The fact is that the meter, which uh, may soon become tedious at the slow and solid speed of tragedy, acquires a kind of vivacity and briskness at the faster pace of comedy. But later in my career, I have not given in to this kind of translatorial license. I feel that, after all, the form in Shakespeare should be respected and not arbitrarily changed, precisely because it carries so much meaning in itself. The dream, as well as other comedies, presents other problems which definitely call for changes. Puns and punning names, for instance. In all of the comedies, we find characters which names alluding to something rather than just designating the individuals, and such names must be translated. So, how should one translate Nick Bottom's name? All of the root mechanicals uh, have names that somehow point to their traits, as many editors have observed. Quince has been linked to coins or carpenter's wedges, and snug may mean close fitting, like the word vagina. That's all very well, but quince is also a fruit, and snug means comfortable, and these are the meaning, meanings that spring to mind first. At the bottom is a bottom of thread appropriate to a weaver, but the word certainly means other things as well. As chance would have it, this very first translation of Shakespeare of mine was commissioned by a Danish theatre which had also hired the British director Richard Dick Bidet to stage it. I was summoned to a meeting with Dick Bidet and uh, listened eagerly to his comments and suggestions. This was back in 1985, and I was a Shakespeare lover already, but not as well informed as I hope to be today. When the question of names came up, and Bottom was mentioned, Dick Bidet rose from his chair, he turned round, said, Bottom means this, and slapped his own behind very loudly. I'll never forget that. So I decided to uh, skip the decent and, to be honest, rather prudish solutions of earlier translators and call bottom rumpe in Danish, <laughs> meaning precisely that, tracks are behind or rump. Okay, gone was the allusion to the weaver's tray, but the gains were greater. The name even allowed me to make a nice uh, malapropism for him in the fourth act when he wakes up and is quite bewildered by the dream he has had. He said, I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. <clears throat> a ballad, not a ballet, we were just, uh, there were well, divergences between editions here, but uh, a ballad is what I suppose it to be. It shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it has no bottom. <laughs> in Danish, he says, again in little back translation, it shall be called Bottom's Dream, because there is no end to how overbottoming it is. And the word in Danish is overrumpende, which is a corruption of overrumpende, which means surprising. <laughs> um, and the word end, by the way, in Danish, in it is also another Danish synonym for backside, behind, or wrong. Likewise, I kept the translation which first springs to mind of uh, quince, in Danish, kvede, as the fruit, but it also has the benefit of pointing to quince's function as the company's playwright and poet, because as a word, as a verb, it, uh, this word it means to chant, like the bars used to be in the old days. And snout, the tinker, was made into trune, the Danish word for a pig snout, and I couldn't resist giving him a middle initial in the roll call scene in the first act, so instead of Tom snout, he became Thomas B. Trune, which to a Danish audience recalls Thomas B. Trier, uh, a well-known Danish industrialist who made a fortune from manufacturing heavy machinery. <laughs> That's not bad for a tinker, however. <laughs> In short, I feel convinced that Shakespeare meant these names to be funny rather than subtle hints and professions. And the fact is that the names in my translation often do get a smile when they're pronounced on stage. The combination of acting, physical character, and name must be right, of course, but the basis is there. 
I could add many more names from other companies and tell you what I have felt obliged to transmogrify them into, but let's press on now to other challenges. Puns are an essential part of the farming companies, and they occur in most of the tragedies and histories as well. Shakespeare loved the English language and was constantly experimenting with it, testing it, renewing it, and punning is a most transparent way of doing that. Samuel Johnson's reproachful remark that a quibble was to Shakespeare, quote, the fatal Cleopatra for which he lost the world and was content to lose it, uh, unquote, is unfair because Shakespeare was no Mark Antony. He didn't want to rule the world of language, but to discover it. The Mary Wives of Windsor, another play, is about a lot of things. Foster in love as demanded by Queen Elizabeth, about jealousy, deception, young infatuation, and so on. But it is also very much about language. It opens with a punning scene in which the Welsh parson, Sir Hugh Evans, misunderstands the dialogue between Justice Shallow and his cousin, Slender. This scene comes across as, as somewhat garbled, uh, perhaps due to scribal errors or typesetters mishaps. But clearly enough, the punning revolves around the words Lucius, that's a heraldic word for kites, fish. Uh, Lucius, lice, a coat of arms, and a coat to wear, and even cod, fish. Puns are basically made from similarities between words, but alas, all of these words are absolutely uncivilized in the English, so what to do? The trick is to find another axis, uh, another similarity, as close in meaning to the original as possible, but necessarily different. I chose to explore the similarities between the Danish words kappe, that's a coat to wear, and karpe, a carp, that's where the fish comes in, and the fact that the Danish word skjold, if you have the uh, an article it in front of it, means a shield, uh, and from shield the meaning a coat of arms is, uh, is, is uh, obtained, and that is homonymous with in skjold, which means a stain. Same sound, but different gender. So, when Slender in the original talks about the dozen white looses in their coat, and shallow as it's an old coat. And Evans answers, the dozen white louses do become an old coat well. And the Danish version in back translation has Slender talk about 12 white carps in their shield. And shallow as it's an old shield. And Evans answered, you will often see an old stain on a coat. This is nonsense English, of course, but uh, it works in Danish and it provides the platform for planning to go on during the next lines. So what is lost and what is found in translation like this? The looses, the pikes, are out in favor of the cups, and the louses or mice have been replaced by an admittedly more tolerable stain. And with the Lucys, we lose the connection to the dubious anecdote about Shakespeare's conflict with Sir Thomas Lucy, who purportedly had him punished for poaching. But that's no great loss, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> what's retained is the exchange of misunderstandings between the three characters in a clearer form than the slightly babbled original. This is one of the advantages of translation. And the establishment of the personalities. The pride of shallow and slender in their ancestry and their coat of arms is made ridiculous by Evans, who seems to believe that they are just talking about a smelly old cloak. And the quick establishing of characters is far more important than linguistic uh, nice terms. Moreover, Evans's character is established as a foreigner, a Welshman, because he fails to distinguish between the vowel qualities of carpe with a long R and carpe with a short one. This is a typical mistake made by non-native speakers of Danish. There are two foreigners in the Mary Wives, Evans and the French Dr. Chaos, and their accents and misunderstandings contribute greatly to the fun. I had no problems whatsoever with the French accent of the doctor. Uh, in fact, my greatest concern was that he might come too close to our prince consort, who is French, and whose <laughs> accent is very well known. <laughs> but Evans, Evans posed the problem. 
practically nobody in Denmark knows what a Welshman sounds like. <laughs> Danish with a Welsh accent is so rare that nobody can make it. <laughs> so, in the first version of my translation, which was commissioned by the Royal Theatre, I decided, and that's another confession I had to make, I decided to make a Norwegian <laughs> A Norwegian accent would certainly ring a bell, and the Danes' popular notions about Norwegians are not far from those of the English. <laughs> Britain's pistols uh, outburst against Evans in that same first scene. Ha! Now a mountain foreigner would <laughs> fit a Norwegian perfectly. <laughs> However, it didn't work. Dr. Caves got all the laughs and Evans got none. The actor who played him did his best, but somehow it simply wasn't funny. And when I revised my translation last year, as I had published in the next volume of my complete plays of Shakespeare, I decided to change Evans back into a Welshman and make up a kind of artificial Danish with a Welsh accent, following Schaeffler's lead in substituting P's for P's and T's for T's and so on. I don't know yet whether it would work better on stage, but at least I, f I feel better about it. <clears throat> Such attempts as this uh, localizing Evans as a Norwegian will often suggest themselves, and they are often prompted by another aspect of punning, the allusion to commonly known facts. <clears throat> there is a nice example in Twelfth Night, first act 15, where Malvolio talks very condescendingly of Festi the fool. I marvel your ladyship takes delight in such a barren task. I saw him put down the other day with an ordinary fool that has no more brain than a stone. At first glance, there's nothing remarkable about this last sentence. Malvolio claims to have seen Festi put down, that is defeated in the contest of wit, by a common and rather unintelligent fool. But if you happen to know that ordinary in early modern English might also mean a tavern where cheap ordinary means were served, and that there was a well known Elizabethan jester by the name of Stone, then the sentence hints at a second and more specific meaning. Feste has been defeated by a competitor, a stand-up comedian so bad that he has to perform for his supper at a cheap restaurant. It's very unlikely, of course, that a modern English reader of the Goa will catch this sophisticated insult without the help of an annotated edition. The jester stone is long dead and forgotten, and ordinary has lost its culinary meaning. But the allusion will probably not have been lost on audience uh, in Shakespeare's own time. And one of the tempting possibilities for a translator is to recreate this kind of subtleties in a way which makes sense to a modern audience, something which not even the best staging of the original text can achieve. I tried. So in Danish, and that'll be the last Danish sentence you're going to hear, I ja så han sat til væks forleden af en værtshustumpe, dumt som en dør og uden en dyrk, der passer. And a literal back translation again. I saw him defeated the other day by a tavern nitwit, stupid as a door, and without a picklock that fits. <laughs> now, this really craves an explanation, so I'll kill the joke in <laughs> the The idiomatic English expression, no more wit than a stone, matches the idiomatic Danish expression, stupid as a door. Don't say the Maybe some of you will remember the phrase, dead as a doornail from Dickens, uh, just the same. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, it's uh, right in, in front of the word. And uh, the word picklock uh, is in Danish dirk, while fits is passer. And together these two words <laughs> form the name of dirk passer, the best loved Danish comic act of the 20th century. So what one hears in passing is uden dirk passer, matching no more than stone, and giving a fleeting suggestion of Feste being inferior to someone who is inferior to a renowned comedian. It usually takes the audience a second or so to react to this, but they do <laughs> think. <laughs> I've dwelt in such detail in some of these examples because they so clearly demonstrate the obstacles pronounced by the relative incompatibility of languages and the strategies for surmounting them. But of course, there is much more to comedy than laughing, and much more to translation than cultural nut cracking. A translator of Shakespeare must be able to visualize what's happening on stage, to understand the subtext, and to feel the timing. A translator of Shakespeare must decide for himself or herself 
what makes the characters tick, even if it may clash later on with the opinions of the stage director, and what follows then in that case is a natural negotiation. A translator of Shakespeare must, in brief, respect Shakespeare as a practical man of the theater and a poetic genius, for he is both at all times. His fools are sad because they understand the other characters so well. His melancholy lovers are funny because they understand so little of themselves. There is never a caricature without compassion, and there is never an ideal without a flaw. And all of this must be accommodated in the target language. Let me give you just two more examples to explain what I mean by this. The first one is short. In the final scene of Twelfth Night, as everyone is preparing for the festivities and the weddings, which are traditionally part of a happy ending in Shakespeare's comedies, the only character on stage who is really hurt and humiliated, stripped of his hopes, his illusions, and his dignity, and left with nothing but resentment, is the pompous Maborio. And yet, his exit line is remarkably short and unpompous. I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you. It is a pentameter, but almost a failed one. It is bursting in the seams with its anger, and the translation of it should be as short and colloquial in Danish. Earlier Danish translations had, again in back translation, I'll revenge myself on your whole pack. I chose a more vernacular variation, with, uh, which incidentally co coincides with the English syntax. I revenge myself on the whole gang of you. An actor may, of course, choose to cover his pomposity even at his exit. But the translation must make room for the desperate edge to it and make it possible for the actor to exit fuming or on the verge of tears or despondent because the final meaning of this short line depends on how it is spoken on stage. The second example will be a bit longer because it's from The Two Gentlemen of Verona, a play which is less frequently performed and perhaps not as familiar. <clears throat> so just to refresh your memory, the two young gentlemen, Proteus and Valentine, are each other's best friends. Proteus loves Julian, Valentine loves no one. Valentine goes to Milan, falls in love with Sylvia. Proteus comes to Milan and costs Sylvia too. After many twists and turns, they all end up in the same forest at the same time, but Valentine appears only at the moment when Proteus attempts to break Sylvia. And after three astoundingly short speeches of outrage by Valentine, contrition by Proteus, and magnanimity by Valentine, Valentine offers Sylvia to Proteus as a gift. Julia faints, but Tarkon comes to again and fights back. And the play goes on for another 90 lines or so, bringing more protagonists on stage and tying the last loose ends of the plot. But reading it, one can't help feel baffled by the clumsiness of it all. What the matter here? When you read it, you tend to forget that uh, from the moment Valentine enters and interrupts the attempted rape, Sylvia does not speak one word. Did Shakespeare simply forget that? Not likely. Or maybe the young male actor playing Sylvia was not up to the noble, indignant, and faithful speech one would expect from her at this point. So Shakespeare simply cut those lines. That's possible, but it's not very likely either. The translator, bearing in mind that Sylvia is still on stage, faces the most peculiar task here to translate Sylvia's silence. Of course there must be reactions from her, reactions to Valentine, who seems to treat her like a chattel. Reaction, reactions to Julia, who reveals herself as Proteus' lover, disguised as a page. Reactions to Thurio, the rival suitor who enters to claim her. Reactions to her own father, who suddenly accepts her choice of husband. It is as if most of the speeches here are, on another level, directed towards Sylvia, hoping for her approval, renouncing her, offering her forgiveness for her filial disobedience. All the other speakers know her and admire her, and the key to solving the Gordian knot of conflicts is what she thinks of them. I think it's the only way to make sense of Sylvia's silent presence, and 
I'll best, I, I bet my best quill that she knew it. It doesn't have to change very much, if anything, in the wording of the translation, but all the speeches must take into account this double address, speaking to someone and glancing at Sylvia. The translator must not concentrate on the words alone, but think like a dramatist. So let's get to the real bottom line, the, is the end result of this, uh, of many more deliberations. I mean, there's so many aspects of this, so I could have been going on for two hours. Uh, I won't, like, assure you. But is it possible to translate Shakespearean comedy? I say yes. With the right mix of audacity and reverence, you can't find means to play the word play in another field. You can link the idiosyncrasies of one culture to the idiosyncrasies of another. And you can even restore or refresh features of the original of which, for various reasons, have become unintelligible. I'd like to quote here something that Stanley Wells, of whom I am a great admirer, once wrote. A too often repeated cliché about Shakespeare says that his greatness lies all in the poetry. And it is true that some of his verbal effects, such as those relying on rhythm, rhyme, and word play, may be variously untranslatable into other languages. But this is not to say that in the hands of skillful translators, such effects may not be replaceable by a poetry which, inspired by the original and attempting to recreate its linguistic theatric uh, theatricality, that's what it's true. Uh, is nevertheless native to the language into which the translation is being made. It is even possible to argue that translation can improve on Shakespeare. In any case, it does Shakespeare a disservice to suggest that there is no more to his language than a meaningless shimmer of word music. Be that as it may, it goes without saying that no translation can ever supplant Shakespeare's own words as the inexhaustible source which we all return to. But in an age where Shakespeare is becoming the spiritual property of all nations and not just of the English, I think it's safe to say that translations can create a rainbow of diversity around the shining light of the Shakespearean So, 
As to the background on the translation, um, very little is known. So, as I said, Yehuda Elkind is completely unheard of as an, as an author or translator, apart from Musa Zorra, and there's also very little biographical information about him. But all that's known is that he was a public official from Kiev, um, and that he died a year after the translation came out. So, um, it's interesting because Musa Zorra is the only comedy among these early translations. The other five are all tragedies. Um, and it's also interesting why he chose to translate Shrew out of all of the available comedies. Um, one possibility is the existence and apparent popularity of a Russian translation, um, Alexander Ostrovsky's 1865 version, um, called Ukrashenia uh, Svayn Ravnoy, which is given as the Russian version of the title page on, on the Hebrew translation. Um, but it's not, it's not actually clear that that's what it's uh, modeled on. But um, examination of Musa Sorora offers a really intriguing and unique perspective on the translation of Shakespearean comedy because it, it illustrates how such a work might be translated into a very different cultural um, and religious setting. So, in general, Elkin's translation is, is relatively um, faithful, so in, in contrast to um, many 18th century Shakespeare adaptations into European languages. It preserves the verse and the prose distinctions of, of the um, English version. It typically maintains the original line divisions, and it doesn't really stray too far from the individual sense of the lines. Um, but, in keeping with the general ethos of Jewish Enlightenment translation, and of this group of Shakespeare translations in particular, Elkin typically um, resorts to a very domesticating, Judaizing approach which results in a target text that does display quite a few remarkable differences from the original. And there are many, really interesting aspects of the translation, but the one that I'm going to focus on today is um, his depiction of the Petruchio and Catherine story. So, um, following on from yesterday's workshop. Um, in, in this respect, his Judaizing translation choices have a very striking and specific effect. An important element of um, Jewish Enlightenment Hebrew writing is a technique called shibutz. Um, which means the insertion of biblical fragments, so biblical verses or parts of verses, into original compositions. Um, and the, one of the reasons that um, Jewish Enlightenment authors did this was because, as I said, because Hebrew wasn't a spoken language, they were kind of working with a sort of a repository, they had like a, a database of Hebrew texts that they could sort of um, select from in, in their own writing, so that they looked for ready-made phrases that, that, that they knew, and they um, focused particularly on Biblical Hebrew rather than later types of Hebrew, because they um, valued Biblical Hebrew most highly. So it's important to keep this concept of shibutz in mind, because Elkin uses this technique in very conscious ways to create a certain effect through selecting verses and phrases from Biblical texts that have particular associations. So he seems to go for alterations um, that highlight the romantic elements of the story and downplay the perhaps more unsavory ones, while simultaneously rooting Shakespeare's couple in a tradition of classic Jewish models of love going back to the Hebrew Bible. And among the, his choices, there's a particularly prominent use of images from two biblical books, Song of Songs, which is the Bible's quintessential love poem, and the Book of Ruth, the story of the Moabite woman who chose to join the Jewish people and, and married a prominent um, Israelite, Boaz, and then became immortalized as the great-grandmother of King David. So the effect that he creates is one of a kind of um, light romantic comedy that's very strongly rooted in, in Jewish and specifically biblical tradition. So I'll just look at a few of these points in more depth. The first clue that we get to the focus of Elkin's translation appears at the very beginning of the play in the induction. So, he introduces a note that it's set in Shavon, which is um, the, the name of the northern coastal plain of Israel. Um, so, Tavern in Shavon. Um, and at first glance, this just looks like a kind of an, an obvious and somewhat unwarranted Judaizing decision. Um, since, depending on the edition that he was using, there might not have been any location mentioned anyway, but it's not like, really a very important point. Um, but the choice of Shalom is more specific than that, because the name very obviously evokes Song of Songs, Ani Chavet Zelat Shalom, from Song of Songs 2.1. So this change has the effect of like, kind of setting the scene by putting the idea of a sort of uh, a love story into the reader's mind, because Jews would have been very familiar with Song of Songs and they would have known its romantic connotations. And in keeping with this elsewhere in the induction, 
Sly's place of origin, Bruce and Heath in the original, is just omitted, and the reference to Marion Hackett, the alewife of Lincoln, is kind of formed in a similar way. So she's, um, she becomes a Hatzelponita from the Pitish Menan Shavavavit Ayayim Boshawon, the tavern in Shavon again. Um, Elkin's next um, romantic Judaizing translation move is apparent in the selection of names for his two main characters. So, in Elkin's version, um, Petruchio is called Peretz. Um, so Peretz is he's the namesake of, of the biblical Peretz, the son of Tamar and Judah, whose story is told in Genesis 38. But more significantly for us, he's also mentioned in the Book of Ruth, where he's listed as an ancestor of the protagonist Boaz, who himself becomes King David's great-grandfather. So why is this important? Um, as I mentioned before, Book of Ruth, along with Song of Songs, is one of the recurring intertexts running through the translation. Um, and again, like Song of Songs, Ruth is a very familiar text among Jews. It's read every year at the festival of, of Shavuot um, in late spring, and it's famous for its depiction of Ruth as a model convert to Judaism, and of Ruth and Boaz as a kind of romantic ideal. So the choice of the name Herod obviously sort of immediately evokes, again, one of the sort of best love romantic stories in the Bible. And then we get a similar thing with respect to Catherine. So this is this is really interesting. Again, he chooses a biblical name. He calls her Chogla. Um, so this one doesn't come from Song of Songs and Ruth. It, um, it's um, a reference. Chogla is one of the daughters of Tzilofechad, um, whose story is, is told in Numbers 27. So like parents, the daughters of Tzilofechad have very specific connotations in Jewish tradition. So, the story is set during the Israelites' 40 years sojourn in the desert following the exodus from Egypt. And according to the recently given divine laws, only male children can inherit the land that was apportioned among the tribes in anticipation of their upcoming settlement of Canaan. So Lofah had his only daughters, he has five daughters. And when he dies, the daughters go to Moses with a complaint. Why can't they inherit their father's allocated portion of land? Is there no sense? So this is considered to be quite a striking act of independence and confidence because the, the daughters that leave their tents, they go into a public space, which, which was male, um, and they request an audience with the elite of the Israelite camp and they demand equal rights um, with their male counterparts. So Moses takes the case to God. God says, yeah, you're right. Um, well, they're right. Um, <laughs> and, um, so he, and God fixes the law and changes it so the daughters can inherit the father's portion of land. And the daughters of Tzalofahad are, are mentioned, they're kind of famous in subsequent Jewish tradition, um, like in, in the Talmud, as models of wise, forward-thinking women who are unafraid to fight for their entitlements. So, on the one hand, Elkin presents Peretz as a sort of devoted, romantic hero, um, and then he kind of can't help painting a positive picture of, of Hogla as a confident, independent woman who's aware of her rights and um, will stand up for them. And in case you're wondering, Baptista is called Tzalofahad. So, just to make that clear, the two sisters are labeled in the character list at the beginning of the translation as Bnot Tzalofachat, the daughters of Tzalofachat, even though he only has two. So, um, regarding Peretz, the romantic associations don't stop with his name, but they extend to many other elements of his speech. So, um, in the original, in, in Act 2, Scene 2, just before Petruchio is introduced to Catherine, um, he makes this statement about his potential bride. Now, by the world, it is a lusty wench. I'm sorry, there's lots of stuff on here how easy it is to see, but up at the top is the English original. Um, and then on the top right you've got um, Elkin's version. So, So, this is now a noble-hearted woman of valor. So, it's quite different. And the trans transition has two interesting aspects. So, first of all, um, the replacement of a lusty wench with Eshet Chayel, a woman of valor, is really rich in romantic um, resonances. Um, the phrase is, is well known firstly from its appearance in Proverbs 31, um, which is a poem praising the virtuous wife and it's traditionally sung every Friday evening in Jewish homes. And in addition, and also importantly in our context, it appears in Ruth. So um, those two translations, the, the two biblical verses are um, down below, Woman of Valor, you can find. And then in Ruth, Kol Shalami Ki Eshet Chayelat, so everyone knows that you're a woman of valor. Um, so, the use of, um, of Eshekayel kind of, um, firstly, summons up this extremely well-known concept among Jews, and it brings to mind thoughts of the ideal woman who is competent, kind, intelligent, hard-working, and obviously um, it has the simultaneous effect of summoning up thoughts of Ruth, the romantic heroine. 
Um, and then secondly, another kind of a little interesting addition that he's done is um, that he introduces the term eshekhaya with a very familiar phrase from Genesis 2.23, um, Zoltapam etzimats me. So when um, Adam, in, um, in the creation story, Adam, the, the man is created and, and he doesn't have a counterpart and then um, God makes um, the woman for him and, um, and Adam says, ah, this is, this is now a bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. So it's kind of, has the additional effect of linking um, Patricia and Catherine to the sort of primordial cup of the creation story, which also has, has positive connotations in the Jewish tradition. Um, so the, the sort of biblical love imagery continues with um, the description of, um, of Catherine when um, Patricia first sets eyes on her in Act in, um, so in the original, in Act 2 again. So he says, the prettiest cake in Christendom. Now, obviously, this is going to be a candidate for Judaization, <laughs> so it wouldn't look good in the uh, in, uh, Jewish Enlightenment translation. So um, he comes up with this solution, um, um, so charming Chaga, and Chaga is, is his nickname, it's like Kate. Um, so um, this Chaga from the Class of the Rock is another reference to the Song of Songs, um, so it's from Song of Songs 2.14. Um, and so, again, we've got sort of this kind of recurring sort of romantic love imagery. Um, another subtle but important change of this kind is, um, can be seen in Patricio's infamous speech in Act 3, Scene 2, just after the disastrous wedding, but which more in a minute. So in the original, Patricio says, she's my goods, my chattels, etc. And in Elvin's version, the list is slightly different. So, um, I've just because of um, because of space I've I haven't trans I've only transliterated the kind of the most important bits but Akuzati um, my estate Tirati my palace Beti Klebeti Sadi Golni Vyakvi so palace my house my household vessels my field my threshing floor my vineyard my horse my ox okay so um, first of all. Um, there are a few things missing. Elkind has left out the metaphors which might be seen as more disrespectful, um, goods, chattels, ass, and he replaces some of the others with more kind of elegant ones, estate, palace, vineyard. So that's sort of one change in this kind of slightly more sort of pleasant romantic direction. And then secondly, we've again got um, a reinfor reinforcement with allusions to the Book of Ruth and Song of Songs. So first we have Gowen, Gomi, um, that's um, on the right in the transliteration, threshing floor. So the Golan is of pivotal importance in Ruth. It's the place where Ruth goes out to seek Boaz and ask him to marry her. So obviously that has strong romantic connotations. Um, and that's the, the first book of the quote near the bottom. And then secondly, um, Tira, Palace, um, appears in Song of Songs 8-9, again in a very romantic um, context. So, Nivnea um, Lea Tirat Kasif will build upon her a palace of silver. And there's actually another interesting point about this passage, aside from all of this, which is that Shakespeare, in the original, was actually doing a bit of shibuts himself, um, because the, the original English lines are partially based on um, the biblical verse um, from Exodus 20 17 from the Ten Commandments. So when he says, My ox, my ass, that's um, referring to, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, nor his ox, nor his ass. Because of Elkin's familiarity with the Bible and the fact that the Ten Commandments are as famous and central a concept in, in Judaism as in Christianity, he would undoubtedly recognize this reference. And given his predilection for Shibutz, it would make sense for him to go back to the biblical original and insert that into his translation at the appropriate place. The fact that he doesn't do that by consciously choosing to omit the term chamol, as, which um, is as unromantic in, in Hebrew as it is in English, um, can be, I think, can be taken as confirmation of his desire to romanticize the source, source text. Um, so, um, unsurprisingly, Peretz and Cholgo's wedding scene helps to sort of build up this romantic and distinctly Jewish picture. In the original, um, Baptiste refers to the wedding in the following terms. So what mockery will it be to want the bridegroom when the priest attends to speak the ceremonial rites of marriage? And in Elkin's version we get um, something similar, but it, but it says, um, So to arrange the wedding canopy and the marriage blessing. So this is, this is, I think this is a fantastic solution because parents and Kogla obviously are having a Jewish wedding here. They have a chuppah 
um, the traditional wedding canopy that um, the, the couple and the family stand under during the ceremony. And they're also going to hear Bechot and Nisuin, the wedding blessings, which is a set phrase that adds another sort of particularly Jewish flavor to the proceedings because this is the name for the blessings that are said during the um, Jewish wedding. Um, the wedding offers Elkin another opportunity to link Shakespeare's characters to Ruth and Boaz. So we've got um, this year, Lois my Patricia's wife, it would please him come and marry her. And in Hebrew, it's look at who I should parents and to wife so that the wife look at the wife of bad parents. If he would deign to come and spread his garment over her. So this again is a direct reference to Ruth. Um, in Ruth three nine. Ruth asked Boaz to spread his garment over her as a formal act of espousal in the Gohan, in the threshing floor. And um, we have one final echo of Ruth in the play's closing scene when Petruchio announces his victory in the wager of the other two husbands. So in the original he says, we three are married, but you two are sped. And by contrast, Paris comes out with this statement, which at first does make me think that something has gone horribly wrong with the translation. <laughs> so I'll shine all that now. Um, but this is actually a really clever functional equivalent, I think. So parents is referring to um, the biblical ritual of chalitza. So according to biblical laws, if a married man dies without heirs, his brother is obligated to marry the widow and raise children in the dead man's name. And if a brother didn't want to perform this duty, usually because like, he didn't like the idea of having to raise his children in someone else's name, um, the ritual was that he had to appear in public and the dead man's widow had to come, take off his shoe, throw it at him, spit on him, <laughs> and declare, that shall be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. So, thereby relieving him of the duty, but also shaming him in public. And one of the best known biblical references to Chalitza appears, where else? In the book of Ruth. Because Ruth has to perform the ceremony before she can marry, marry Boaz. Um, and so that's the, that's the, the quote from the reference from the book of Ruth, um, by Yishlov Nalo, and he removed his sandal and then she throws it at him. So um, again, we have a subtle reference to the biblical love story, um, and also um, El so Elkin kind of paints the um, and Hortensio as failed husbands, like they're worthy of having a shoe thrown at them. Um, so, like I said, um, Elkin's transformation of the play into a Jewish love story is only one aspect of the really interesting elements of um, of the adaptation. But I hope that it's given you something of a taste of this unusual perspective on. Um, Shakespearean comedy in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much for these two really, really fascinating talks. Um, we are kind of out of time, but I think it, it, it was so fascinating that I don't mind. So, so let's let's just you know hang on uh, for another ten minutes here and um, and take questions. Thank you both so much for such interesting talks. Um, uh, I'm interested in, you've both talked about translations from over time, but definitely different periods. So I'm just interested about translation, given what you've both shown and how they plug into a particular kind of process or a particular reference points that maybe are very relevant for a group or for a period. I'm just wondering about, it might, uh, I suppose, in two different ways, given your papers, how they work over time. So you talked about one of your earliest translations and how you maybe feel about it over time. And then with your translation, I wonder if it's still performed now or if it's been supplanted by others. first. Okay, so no, these um, these early translations from, from the end of the 19th century are all, all almost completely forgotten, if not completely forgotten. So this one is like so obscure um, that you know, it's like no one has heard of it. Um, and Shakespeare has since been translated into Hebrew um, it, Sort of varying different periods, and so um, there's a group of um, American translations that were done in the 20s, um, which is kind of like the next mm. period, I guess. There are these sort of late 19th century ones before the revernacularization, and then there's that period, and then there are some translations from the 40s and 50s, so like the early um, kind of state period, the state of Israel. Um, and now there um, is a, a like there, I mean, there's a selection of, of modern translations, but the most um, popular ones are um, by a translator called Dory Parnas, who did the um, uh, Merchant of Venice translation that was going mm -hmm. to Globe. And those are all completely different. They don't do anything like this. They're not, yeah, they're not Judaizing at all. Mm -hmm. um, they do other things like kind of like more similar things to what you were talking about. So they do have like kind of you know 
um, sort of translations of puns that work in Hebrew and things like that, but they don't do any of this stuff, which I think is it's a shame, but it, it kind of reflects the the sort of changing historical um, circumstances because it, at this time, um, I mean, all of these translators do this, and um, it, it actually dates back to like the medieval period. Um, this kind of concept of Judaizing translations was done um, when, like, the translations of um, like King Arthur was translated into Hebrew in the 13th century, and that was also Judaizing. And so, it, it, I think it's kind of following on from an older. Um, tradition that, you know, you have to, whatever is in Hebrew sort of should reflect Jewish values, which now, it, it's not, it's just kind of, I think the circumstances, it's not like translation isn't really thought of like that anymore. Um, and also, I think now, a lot of people wouldn't recognize the biblical references, whereas then anyone reading this would instantly have known yeah. what he was referring to.